well. And I just reserve recording. Okay, we're good now. Thank you. Um, go back here. Jesus, the Son of God, by his death and resurrection, has broken the chains of sin and death that bound humanity. What does the church actually say happens at a Catholic funeral? The church is interceding on behalf of the deceased. The church is ministering to the sorrowing and consoles them with the comforting word of God and the sacrament of the Eucharist. We're offering worship, praise, and thanksgiving to God for the gift of a life which has now been returned to God. We are commending the dead to God's merciful love and pleading for the forgiveness of their sins. And we are affirming and expressing the union of the church on earth with the church in heaven. We used to call ourselves the church militant and the church triumphant. I think I like the church on earth and the church in heaven. Um, <laughs> Responsibility for the ministry of consolation rests with the believing community. Um, I think you all know, and this is uh, from the work of Ruth for many years and Anne for many years and our, our grief support group that many, many people say that the funerals that they have celebrated at Bellarmine have been among the most prayerful and carefully planned and hospitable and welcoming. And, and so um, I think that our community has a strong sense that we provide the ministry of consolation. Now, par by participating in here, so here are the three, the three segments of this sort of one continuing ritual, the vigil, the mass, and the committal. And we'll talk about each of those in a minute. You know, Jane, I'm going to interrupt because Many of us don't use the vigil term. We rather call it the visitation. That's we right. Call it the visitation. Yeah, thank you, Anne. So right, vigil in this case does equal uh, visitation. That's right. Uh, and we want family members, of course, to take an active part in these ministries, but they should not be asked to assume a role that their grief or deep sense of loss may make just too difficult for them. In every celebration for the dead, the church attaches great importance to the reading of the word of God. Above all, the readings tell of God's designs for a world in which suffering and death will relinquish their hold on all whom God has called God's own. You see a list of some readings here. One of the attachments I sent to you is a PDF of uh, frequently chosen scriptures to be used at funerals. We have an actual hard copy booklet at the chapel that we offer grieving families. But during this time of meeting remotely, um, I discovered um, that PDF. So that's there for you. These symbols and rituals we're all familiar with. Water, of course, reminding us of our baptism, sprinkling on, on the casket, uh, right at the door as the body is received. The white pall reminding us also of the white garment that we received at baptism. The Easter candle, of course. The colors. Now, this is very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm really surprised to see, although I've heard that there are some priests in our archdiocese who do wear black at a funeral. This, um, this sequence of, of colored chasubles gives them permission to do that. It's not preferred, white is preferred, but um, it's still an option. I'm surprised that after Vatican II, we still have that there, but uh, should express Christian hope, but not be offensive to human grief or sorrow. So we always have that, that balance. And then of course, the music that is selected by, by the family or, or by you. Okay, so these three stages, the vigil or visitation or, or wake, 
or viewing, viewing is another word, um, takes place usually uh, often the day or the night before. So this is the principal rite celebrated by the church in this time in between the time of death and the funeral liturgy itself. It may be celebrated in the home of the deceased or a funeral home, the church itself. We do this, of course, in the narthex when that's uh, requested or some other suitable place. What is, um, what is maybe not done frequently enough is um, prepare some prayer experience for this visitation. The suggestion here is to use the liturgy of the hours, you know, the prayer of the church, specifically the office for the dead is included there, uh, or a liturgy of the word. And this is a chance to select other scriptures that have not already been chosen for the funeral liturgy itself. You know, other, other scriptures that would be comforting to the family. Uh, it's the practice in many funeral homes to have uh, the priest or someone else lead the rosary if that's um, preferred by the family or some other kind of prayer. But the, the point in listing this separately is to really call it a stage of a funeral. Uh, we could say it's a little bit like, you know, one part of our, our triduum. We say that our Holy Thursday, Good Friday and Easter Vigil are kind of all one continuous liturgy that, that flow out of one and into the other. This is, this is a little bit like that. So, so the vigil or visitation really is a time, a time of prayer and has a liturgical dimension to it. Um, the body uh, is most always there, the body or the cremains of, of the deceased. The liturgy itself, um, this would be the central piece of these three pieces of, of the same liturgy. Uh, and it can be done within or outside of mass. It can be just a liturgy of the word by itself. Um, it could be just a communion service. Um, again, depending on family's wishes, the, um, the loved one's wishes and so on. So there is a reception of the body that takes place at the door. You've seen this, the family gathers at the door. There is the, the beautiful, beautiful ritual of placing the white pall on the casket by members of the family and then um, blessing it with holy water. And then the final commendation takes place before the dismissal. That would be, um, we have several versions of that. One is a spoken version with a, with the refrain, receive her soul and present her to God, to God the most high. Um, there's another one that has language of uh, the angels taking the loved one to paradise. So uh, that can be chosen uh, very specifically by preference. <clears throat> the committal then would be the final act of the community of faith and caring for the body of its deceased member. So this is at the graveside, this is in the mausoleum, uh, the columbarium, wherever the, the final place of rest is. And, and Jane, I think uh -huh. that many of us are, are aware that there, that the first two parts of the vigil or the visitation and the mass aren't able to happen at this time because of COVID. So the committal becomes ever more important. And well, I think some uh, times there have been a ritual, a kind of ritual for the committal. And it's brought, um, well, of course the burial, but it's brought comfort to the families who could gather at the cemetery or wherever uh, mm -hmm. for the c committal. And that's just the way life is in COVID. Well, thank you for that, Anne. And, and we've actually had both situations in COVID. We, we've, had, we've had several funeral masses that have had 
only the immediate family, Brennan, Brennan Hill's funeral, Marie and their two children were there and spouses, uh, just the immediate family only. They, they chose to do that, but still have the full massive Christian burial. Uh, in the case of Marianne Berwinkle, they're, they're a very large family with their you know, number of adult children were, were back and forth. They had a funeral planned uh, in the chapel, but when our, our Hamilton County level went to purple, several of Hank's uh, children ca came to him and said, dad, we, we just should not gather in the chapel. Let's delay that. So they made the very difficult decision it was because the other half of the children really did want to still be at social distance and still come to the chapel. However, their final decision was to just uh, lay Marianne to rest. And so Richard did that with the funeral uh, on a Friday morning out at Gate of Heaven and they'll do a memorial mass at a later time. Jane, I guess something? Yes. Uh -huh. um, sure. Okay. I was just at a funeral of a neighbor this weekend and they were told that they couldn't sing in church because of COVID. Yes. And so the mother of the deceased said, oh, well, our family likes to sing. We'll sing outside then. And so at the end of May, the whole body of the church, every whole procession went out to the front of church. They put the casket right out there with roses on it. They had distributed copies of Holy God, We Praise Your Name. And the whole congregation gathered around the casket in the front of the church and sang, Holy God, We Praise Your Name. It was just beautiful. That's very, very beautiful. What an adaptation. Yes. <clears throat> well. Uh, it's creative, it's creative creativity in 2021. Well, that's been a difficult uh, subject. Yes, we, we try to, we are trying to keep the singing at a minimum, but you don't, nobody wants to minimize the singing at a funeral. So we're trying to work with that. Uh, so, you know, there, the, the suggestion is that the, the vigil actually be, you know, be prepared. Uh, at what time during this visitation will we pause and have prayer? Who will the leader of prayer be? someone in the family or, um, or the priest who is coming or, uh, you know, these are all choices to be made. It certainly would be a chance to have uh, a non-ordained person lead these prayers because uh, it, it would not be required that they be led by an ordained person. And any other uh, ministers of prayer, what scriptures would you select for that? You could have intercessions. Um, again, you know, maybe different ones that then have been prepared for the funeral the next day. Uh, music. You probably would not want to be singing now during COVID in a funeral home, but uh, certainly music can be played. Oftentimes the family will have up on a screen, uh, you know, some video of of the loved one there. Um, what was I gonna say? Oh, what is not added here is um, words of remembrance. So that came up at this workshop. If there are a number of people who would like to give words of remembrance, you know, the time at mass is a, is a little bit limited for that, then this could be an opportunity also to give, to give some words of remembrance. Uh, yeah, and ways to participate, have other people participate. You could be very creative and do really uh, whatever would be meaningful for the family. Okay, preparing the funeral liturgy. We'll go through our Bellarmine form uh, after we get through the slides, but this is just some general instruction about preparing it. So is it going to be uh, a full mass or is it gonna be uh, outside of mass? What time will it be? What scriptures are we choosing? What music are we choosing? Uh, and then these are lots of decisions to be made. There's always the desire to include as many family members as 
want to participate and for whom it won't be an emotional uh, hardship. Uh, you know, you have grandchildren bringing gifts, um, sons and daughters being pallbearers. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful chance to include as many loved ones as possible for all these different roles. Uh, worship aid, we call this our worship aid, and uh, we are always happy to provide that for the family, and that's another bar part of the preparation, uh, and we'll talk about that when, I, when we do the form, because you have choices about that, too. Okay, and then the committal itself, often the, uh, the person who's been presiding at the liturgy you know, we'll just, again, follow the family immediately afterward to, to the committal, but uh, sometimes it needs to be another person. Uh, of course, the location is already predetermined. Um, a worship aid for this. This was a thought that was suggested um, that the parish could have laminated cards of this part of the liturgy that happens at the graveside there are some responses that, that people make. So that's something for us to be thinking about as a parish, but that might be something to do um, to have available you know, for each of our, our funerals. Um, special consideration. So for the very, very painful funeral of a child, um, it would be, it, it may just be just unbearable for family members to, to do the ministry, the ministerial roles. Um, but that's certainly something for them to decide. Uh, but other liturgical ministers might be needed to be uh, invited for, for this kind of a service. Music. The music um, allows the community to express convictions and feelings that words alone may fail to convey. So this is from uh, number 30 in the order. The texts of songs should express the Paschal mystery of the Lord's suffering, death, and triumph over death, and should be related to the readings from scripture. Um, how will the music be chosen and who will be the music ministers? It seems that music, even more than scriptures, uh, are, are pieces of the liturgy that people have, have strong feelings about. Um, sometimes the, uh, Anne, you were, you were commenting that about the wishes of, of the deceased. Yes, uh, and, maybe not the wishes of the deceased, but the wishes, well, maybe the deceased, but certainly the family has, may have strong opinions about please do not sing uh, this hymn or the other, or please, we want a certain hymn. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they may have a family member who wants to sing or mm -hmm. play an instrument or mm -hmm. uh, add something to the, the music of this uh, program. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we've had at Bellarmine, we've had someone at the time of Charles Kunz's funeral the his sister sang an aria hmm. and well i think that for most times uh at least bellerman has been very permissive and accepting of the desires of people and we we aim to please yes at least there and it's those things that loom so large in the minds and hearts of family because it's, they're, they're very tender and sensitive at this time. And so you don't want to do anything that would add to their sorrow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm remembering too that, that you, you all saw this probably that Brennan's son, Brennan, uh, sang a beautiful piece at yes. his father's funeral too. 
the eulogy, we like to call it the words of remembrance. Typically, you, and you'll see this um, at other parishes, following the prayer after communion, the priest gets up from his chair and goes to stand right, right near the coffin and the Easter candle. The assisting ministers, the acolytes, carry the censer and the holy water and stand right there with him. Um, while a member of the friend of the, or friend of the family may speak in remembrance before the final commendation begins. Um, uh, could somebody put, put your mute on, please? Thank you, excuse me. Um, this would, would very much limit. Uh, yeah, I, can't, I think it's the Dyschels. Uh, yeah, can you ask them? I can't see them on my screen. I can see it, but they're, she's not in front of the camera. Okay. I, I can see it's an empty room. Yeah. Okay. When she comes back to the screen. Okay. Um, I'll try to talk over it. Hey, can, can't you, um, everybody? Mute her. You can mute uh, everybody, I think. Yeah, I'm afraid to leave the slides. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to lose them, but I understand how frustrating you are. Okay, we, we prefer to do this at the beginning of the Mass, before the Mass begins, or right after the opening, opening prayer, actually, uh, to set the tone for the celebration so that people have a good sense of the life of this, this loved one and um, are bringing all of that to the, uh, to the liturgy, to the Eucharist. And the, um, the emphasis here should be on the faith life of, of the person whose life we are celebrating. Um, we, we want to hear you know, lots of things about the life in the context of, of the faith life that they lived. All right, sweetie, you have a good afternoon. Okay, so here are a few things on cremation. The permission for this goes back to 1997. It's been there for a while. Uh, there still is the statement though that, that cremains uh, do not enjoy the same value as the burial of the body. Um, there's, there's a lot of theology about that that I was not prepared to go into, but that's the statement. Um, the preference for the presence of the body for the funeral rites. Um, this, is, this is a way that some families choose to actually have the body there for the funeral mass for this reason here in 413. Um, and then following the funeral, the body is taken for cremation. In that case, you know, if they really want the symbolism of having the full body there, but but want the uh, the practicality or the other reasons for cremation. A, a financial consideration there is that uh, one only has to then rent uh, a casket for the liturgy, so it's not the actual purchase of a full casket and a vault. Um, but the body would need to be. Uh, prepared to uh, to still be uh, there in the coffin at the time of the funeral. Jane? Yes. Am I, am I unmuted? I, I find this terribly difficult. I, I see symbolism and that's fine, but a theological point of view, what in the world enables them to say it doesn't have the same value? Yeah. I, I, that really bothered me. Um, again, Connie, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't have the the, the citations to um, to support that, but uh, well, they but, probably wouldn't convince me anyway. But yeah, and you know, cremation maybe I started in 1997, know. but it's become increasingly more requested. Um, so I think in terms of the you know, the Christian community, the Catholic Christian community that, um, as you say, there is no, there is no difference really. Um, and 
you know, I talked to um, Adele Lippert last week, you know, that Tom died in Florida. Mm -hmm. She said, she said, I, I could tell looking at him, I knew when his spirit had left his body and it was no longer Tom. So when you, when you have that experience too, and you, and you have that, that faith um, experience, then, you know, does this really matter? You know, um, whether you have the body or whether you have the cremains. This, I think we all agree with, right? The cremated remains of a body are treated with the same respect, of course, given to the human body from which they came. Okay, that is as far as I wanted to go with that. Um, let me come back and see you, your faces again. Um, Connie, you wanted to offer a word about donating your body to science. Would you tell us what, what you understand about that? Yeah, just briefly. Um, my husband and I have both done that. To us, it just made a lot of sense. Um, maybe because we were teachers, we chose, you can do it lots of ways. We chose to donate our bodies to the University of Cincinnati Medical School for study. We really liked the idea that it could help doctors. Um, they have a beautiful ceremony afterwards, much afterwards. And every one of those medical students who spoke said that that was the most valuable part of their education mm -hmm. was when they had an actual body to work with. And they worked with that same body for months. I didn't realize that. And I don't know how they do all the preservation. No, I don't know if I want to know. But they said they become very attached to that person. Oh. But it was mainly they're saying this was the most meaningful part of my whole education. So that's what we had done. Um, and I know like at the mass for Furman, I didn't care what we called it, but we were told it couldn't be called a funeral mass because the body wasn't there. It was a called a memorial mass. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, but what's the big deal of what we're doing? Are we dealing with the body primarily? Or are we dealing with that person's whole life when we come together for the mass at the end? So I didn't see the point, um, but anyway, we were very happy with what we did. How we chose to do it. Thank you. And then at at um at the cemetery, the University of Cincinnati has one spot to honor all those who had donated their bodies. And to me, that's yeah. perfectly wonderful. So I can't see Furman's name anywhere. I don't need to. He's there. He's buried there in that general area. I don't need to know which he's in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's but, at Spring Grove, yes. Spring Grove, yeah, it's a beautiful little site and little memorial there. So. There's another option. And yes, and then you don't have any access to it also. Your expenses are practically nil. And the only time we needed a funeral home, I think, was to put the notice in the paper. Somehow we had a funeral home behind. I don't remember exactly, but the whole thing was just very meaningful to us. May I share that I... Thank you, Connie. Go ahead, Mary. Ann. I have determined to uh, donate my body to Boonshoft at Wright State. And... The, um, however long the, the students would be using the body, so be it. At which at the end of which the cremains can be buried in a park-like place there, or they can be returned to the family. I've opted to have my cremains returned to the family because I want to be buried near my husband at New St. Joseph. However, should anything have to change, so be it. I mean, my original intention has been honored for which I'm grateful. And if I can be buried next to Bill, fine. If not, that's fine too. We would have had that option too to return it to the family, but we chose otherwise. Is anybody else having a hard time hearing Connie? Yes. Yes. Oh. You're very difficult to hear you, Connie. You've okay. got wonderful things to tell us. <laughs> I don't know why, but I'll look and see. Oops. Okay, I hope I can pull up. Thank you, Connie.
Mm. Yep. Do you see it? Yes. Oh, good. All right. So here is our, our basic funeral worksheet. It has many of the elements that we've already talked about, but when, uh, when you would come, come in to talk about planning the funeral of a loved one, this is the sheet that, that we use. Um, and so this is the one that we encourage you to, to take and begin to use for, for planning your own funeral if you feel inspired to do that. Um, the top part is just, of course, basic uh, family information, the date, when the visitation will be, uh, will the body be there, cremains, which funeral home, who will give the words of remembrance, who will be the pallbearers, who will place the pall, that's unfolding it on top of the casket, and then beginning to choose the reading. So first reading and who will do that reading, second reading and who will do that. Uh, it doesn't include the responsorial song that needs to be included in there. Um, choosing the gospel, the homily would ordinarily be done by the presider. Prayers of the faithful uh, are always written by the family. And, you know, this is a beautiful moment to include, again, um, you know, siblings or uh, nieces and nephews, um, just a, a, a really meaningful role for them. Gift bearers, um, yeah, we're not doing that during COVID. So that has been one less role to give family members, unfortunately. Um, you've seen that in the live stream. We're just bringing the gifts right from the table there, right to the altar. But otherwise, that's another uh, role that a number of people can, can take. Um, who will be distributing communion. If you have Eucharistic ministers in your family, they're uh, welcome to do that. The choosing of the songs. Opening, oh, here's the psalm. Okay, so yeah, so the opening processional, response, acclamation, presentation of the gifts, these mass parts. There can be a communion song and a separate meditation or reflection song. Uh, the commendation, as I was saying earlier, can be, can be spoken with a sung refrain or it can be uh, the whole thing can be sung. There's several variations of that that uh, Roberta and, do you, do you all know Roberta Whiteley? Roberta has been on the Center for Faith and Justice staff as their director of music for the university. And she has stepped in uh, as an interim person since uh, Brendan moved on. So she has several versions of this commendation uh, as does Amy Benemeyer. James, so yes. Uh -huh. I think <clears throat> we um, went quickly over the words of remembrance. And okay. I think we have tried forever to encourage the length of the words of remembrance to be, well, like five minutes. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've ever been 100% successful. <laughs> I mean, there have been times when the words of remembrance went on for 25 minutes, but mm -hmm. at least it could yes. be addressed that mm -hmm. um, the message could be succinct. And certainly to choose someone who would be able to do it, who, who is not going to be so emotionally uh, impacted by mm -hmm. the task that the person would, as it were, weep through the whole thing. Thank you, yes. I want to say something to that. Uh huh. I wanted to give the eulogy at my husband's funeral. Someone, not someone on the committee, actively tried to discourage me from doing that. And I kind of resented that. And I went ahead and did it. Mm. And I was okay. I just had my niece standing there with a copy of what I wanted to say in case uh. I to... Sometimes you don't know how it's gonna affect you emotionally until you're right there. Sure, so I... yes. There, I didn't need her, but it all went fine. But I, I didn't appreciate 
being discouraged from doing that because I yeah, know. I'm yeah. Happy. No, that's your honor and you're right. Absolutely. Uh, having your niece there was a was a brilliant thing to do. Certainly, anyone who would have discouraged you, Connie, only meant it with love for you, knowing how how well sacred your words would be. No, we we meant no harm. It wasn't anybody on any committee. It was just a friend. Oh, okay. No, no, no. It was not. She just didn't think I should try to do that. I said, no, I want to. Okay. I, I know one better than anyone. <laughs> Uh, I do want to say something about this final commendation. Um, so this is also the part you'll recall where uh, the presider is incensing the body or the cremains. Well, uh, recently, in the recent several funerals that we've had, I've seen Eric do something that I had not seen before. Uh, and maybe you saw this on the live stream for Brennan. He invited Marie to take the censer and to incense her husband's body. It was very, very prayerful, very, very beautiful. Um, and at the Cordy family, the, so this is, so Pam Cordy is a parishioner, as is Holly Maley, two sisters, uh, who are two of 10, 10 adult children uh, of Sue Cordy. This funeral was several weeks ago. All 10 of those adult siblings were there and Eric invited them to stand in a line in the center aisle and one by one, each one came and took the censer and, and incensed uh, his or her mother's body. It was just, it, it's very, very sacred um, and a wonderful, beautiful gesture to give, um, to give the family. So oh, yeah. uh, I asked Eric, Eric if I could you. you know, say that to all of you. He said, "Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep doing that." He learned it at the in the Spanish-speaking community he ministered with up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, years ago. So, uh, it's very dignifying. It's very dignifying. Okay, then uh, recessional final song. Then here are some choices in the the worship aid, as we said. Um, you can choose whatever design. Some people like a photograph, some like the Celtic cross or other design. Uh, can do it on different colored paper. Sometimes on the back, uh, a message from the family or a prayer, the Irish blessing, uh, you know, is often chosen or, you know, some other message that we'd be, would be important to, to the family. Um, just, just practically the cost. So for a uh, for a non parishioner funeral at Bellarmine, it's it's six hundred dollars. For a parishioner, it's four hundred. And out of that four hundred dollars, uh, both the the cantor and an accompanist are paid one hundred twenty five dollars each. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't need to pay them extra. If you have an additional musician, some people like to bring in a violin. Um, then that person uh, would be paid directly by the family. Jane, may I ask a question? Sure. You know, if we've been blessed with a very long life, you have friends from many different religions. Mm -hmm. um, and I have seen too often that when people who are not Catholic come into a Catholic mass, they don't have a clue as to what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, they're, they're rather uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there some method that we can give friends um, how to participate in the Mass and not to have the, the priest or the presider saying, well, for those who aren't Catholic, you know, just come and get blessed. Well, that immediately makes them feel unwelcome. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there a solution to that? Well, the template that we use for the worship aid does include all of the parts of the mass for for that purpose that's one of the purposes anyway you know to help people who are unfamiliar with the parts and the sequence of our of our liturgy um, we we were working on a booklet to have at the chapel a, a hard copy printed booklet to have for for guests and visitors that that got delayed a year ago um, 
but that's that still is a goal to have to have a booklet for somebody coming at any time, not just for a funeral, but that that could be there. I think in the case of that, as you described, Dottie, someone from your family to say to the presider, you know, uh, that you would like him to be especially welcoming of, of people and mindful in the whole presiding about instructions given and just to be very careful about that. Thank you. Sure, we want I, to have people I would just like to interject that at the funeral of Brian Dickerhoof, who died a few years ago, um, there were many CEO type gentlemen in the congregation, um, executives from Procter & Gamble. In fact, two Procter & Gamble people did the eulogy. And at the time of communion, Tom Lawler, who was the pastor at the time, was very welcoming and invited people to come. Um, those coming to the Eucharist could be accompanied by those who would just prefer to come for a blessing. I'm using lumpy language. He was very welcoming in, in his words. I can't tell you how many of those men, all I thought CEO kinds of men, presented themselves for blessing. Mm -hmm. And the next day I said to Tom, oh, I was so touched by the way you handled uh, the Eucharistic distribution yesterday. And it just seemed that your words were such that practically the whole uh, assembly came for blessing. And I said, I was just so touched. And he, Tom said, and so was I. <laughs> so oh, interesting. The, I, we can tell how the presider is impacted. Ruth? One, one of the things that we have never done and some other churches have done is print in the program that people who aren't Catholic are not welcome to the Eucharist or that the Eucharist is only for Catholics in good standing. I've seen it, it was in Amy Venemeyer's father's program. I couldn't believe it. And she had no other choice but to print that in the program. And we have never done that and I hope we never do. Yeah, I agree. Richard also has a very lovely thing that he said and I'm paraphrasing it, but he has said something like, if Eucharist is part of your tradition, we come down the center aisle or I mean something that leaves it open to let people know that they're welcome at Bellarmine. I, I just think Bellarmine has always had such beautiful funerals. Um, and I know a lot of that's been due to different groups. And from my own experience, which was Furman's, um, I just remember being with Ruth and her whole committee were just so wonderful. And what it did, what I realized the day of the funeral, I didn't have to worry about any details. You know, I could just be there. And I, I just thought that was wonderful. And I've heard many people say, it may sound strange, but with beautiful funerals, Solomon has always had. <laughs> what else? We have a few minutes left. That's really what Ann and I had prepared to present. Um, again, in your handouts. Oh, I, so I sent you also, a, uh, if you're interested, uh, a cost sheet from Gilligan and a cost sheet from T.P. White that is in no way an endorsement of those funeral homes. Please know that it's just a sample. Just so uh, I know some people were asking that that be included in this. Just some costs there for you to consider, but not an endorsement at all. Again, you have the, the PDF of readings that are there too. Um, I have a funny story about yeah. Gilligan. Uh, I, <laughs> I was um, investigating costs of funerals for someone who needed a, a low cost funeral. They were poor. And I called Gilligan and the guy from Gilligan said, well, we're an upper class funeral. <laughs> he literally said that to me because I said, we have somebody from the parish who doesn't have a lot of money. And he was kind of like, well, I don't know. I don't know how it compares. I just know that they consider themselves, at least to me, that they were an upper class funeral. I don't okay. think 
upper class might not, not have been the right word. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, it was funny. And Gilligan's been so many times. I guess that was a question I was going to ask, being kind of new to the area. How do you even know how to go about picking a funeral home? I mean, do most well, of the people from Bellarmine use a certain one or? Bruce, say, say what you found out when you looked for Annie, you know, Annie yeah, Covert. I have to tell you, there was a wide variety of prices, as well as prices for uh, graveyards. And um, I went looking for the least expensive and I kind of knew where to look. Um, but I think most people choose a funeral home close to where they live. Oh. If you li live in Anderson Township, you take uh, T.P. White seems to be the, the main one. Um, a lot of the Jesuit priests use Gilligan and it's right up the street from Bellarmine. But um, we've had I mean, I think everybody in town has been to, been to Bellarmine once or twice. I, I don't, I, and we really don't care who it is. Mm -hmm. We pick any funeral from any funeral home. You want me to talk about the least expensive, Jane? Well, sure, just to put that on, on the range here, you, you did the work a few months ago. Well, I'd have to look at the exact price, but- Well, no, no, not the price, just the place. Well, it's in, in Norwood, one of the two Norwood funeral homes. One was more expensive than the other. I, I, I will tell you the thing that I, I can't exactly give you the, I can't remember exactly the name of that funeral home, Jane, but I will tell you an interesting thing that I learned is the, the least expensive grave site in, yeah. the, in the city is Reading Cemetery. And I have to tell you, I got a chill because my mother grew up in Reading. All my relatives, my grandparents, my great aunts on both sides of my maternal uh, family are there. Mm -hmm. And so it was very reassuring for me to find a place for Annie where all my relatives could look after her. <laughs> and I had no idea that was the least expensive in town. And, wow. and it, Sixteen or seventeen hundred dollars, and that is a lot cheaper than most places. Yeah, a lot. You were yes, you were very loving to to Kathy Sivers to help her through that that day. Ruth, thank you, thank you again. Jane, can I add another comment? Sure, Diane. Uh, having been a member at Bellarmine for now ten years, which is hard to believe, <laughs> um, every time there is a song that I find especially touching. I put it in my funeral file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have, and lots of people do the same thing. They save these songs. That's right. They're so beautiful and they're so appropriate. So now I'm going to have to sort through all of those and pick one or two. Yeah, because you're going to have 20 songs that you want oh, and you're yeah. only, there's only a <laughs> slot for about five. Yeah. Um, th that's something that was emphasized in this workshop uh, last week that um, pre-planning your funeral as much as you can could be a great gift to your family, um, to have your wishes already expressed there. You know, it's their decision whether to grant, grant your wishes or not, but at least you have expressed them and, and have placed them there. I wanna take a minute and introduce uh, Mary Jo to you. Do you see Mary Jo on your screen? Mary Jo Blankmeyer is a, a, a newer, more recent, uh, parishioner, but a, a very long friend of Ann Bloom's. Uh, Mary Jo attended that workshop with me and is going to be um, helping us in our, in our bereavement ministry now. Uh, so thank you, Mary Jo, and glad to have you with us. Looking Good forward to, to getting to know you. Yeah. 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 And Mary Ann, Mary Ann Escudero and Sue, Susan Binder uh, are on our pastoral care for seniors team. Thank you both for, for being here too. Uh, Angie does a lot of work with uh, Catholic Charities, uh, supporting caregivers. So uh, she's gonna be offering some resources uh, soon to the parish for training for people to be, uh, to get some caregiver training too. So lots to, to look forward to. That's good. Um, well, thank you all. I hope this was uh, 
helpful and hope you feel inspired. I think those handouts will be a great help too that you had. Good. And feel free to, yeah, share those. And uh, this recording, I'll get it turned around and post it on the YouTube channel. And I'll let people know that in the bulletin that it's there so that those who couldn't be here today uh, can see that too. Jane, are all the other um, end of life videos on going to be posted? The, uh, they are all except the first one. I, I dropped the ball on the uh, power of attorney and the legal concerns that Dave Kammer did with um, Marilyn Ma Ma uh, Mag, but the other ones are there. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes. Is this the final of the series? This is this is the final one. Yes. So Johnny come lightly. That's me. No, they'll be the other ones will be up on the on the live stream. You can see them there. Okay. Johnny, okay. All right. So well, much. peace, everyone. Peace. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. God bless you. All right. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jane. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome.